Hello? Hello? morning. On behalf of the members of the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability, it is my privilege to welcome you to the first plenary session of ICOM's 25th General Conference in Kyoto, Curating Sustainable Futures Through Museums. The choice of sustainability as the theme of the first plenary session is indicative of its significance not only to the organizers of Kyoto 2019, but also to the museum community as a whole. Achieving a sustainable future is arguably the most important challenge the global society faces today. However, it will mean transforming our world. In August 2018, ICOM's president announced the creation of a working group on sustainability. It will deliver its report and recommendations in December this year. The group has registered that there are many pathways to sustainable futures. However, we have identified an overarching model to assist ICOM in its task, aligning our organization with the 17 integrated and indivisible, indivisible sustainable development goals of the United Nations Agenda 2030, adopted on the 25th of September 2015 by 193 countries of the UN General Assembly. One of the most important tasks that the group has engaged in has to be, been to map sustainability initiatives within ICOM and the museum sector. The goal to locate these initiatives within the contemporary museum landscape and provide ICOM's executive board with a necessary overview to enable it to navigate the challenges and opportunities the immediate future brings. This plenary session and the workshop later today are both important parts of this mapping exercise. The mapping exercise has also permitted us to identify two provisional target groups. First, ICOM itself and the global museum sector. The second, the communities we serve. Sustainability with its many different aspects and perspectives combined with the urgency of addressing them is a challenge that the museum sector must recognize and meet systematically, it will require a paradigm shift, one characterized by the integration of sustainability across the entire field of museum practice. Today, our distinguished speakers will give their own unique views on sustainability, reflecting their different backgrounds and personal perspectives, offering their vision for the future. For ICOM, the United Nations, Nations Agenda 2030, espousing people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership offers museums an all-embracing vision of a sustainable future. The theme of Kyoto 2019, Museums as Cultural Hubs, the Future of Tradition, offers another perspective. As hubs or nodes in a global network, museums are linked by common goals and practices. Sustained by tradition, each node is a repository of memories, tangible and intangible. These repositories are collections. By allowing us to know our past, enable us to better understand the present and to prepare ourselves to face the challenges of attaining a sustainable future. The contents of these repositories are the memories of our public. As knowledge institutions, one of our enduring traditions is that of serving our public. We must not forget they also nurture us and the responsibility that entails. The Uruguayan author Eduardo Galeano, in his essay, In Defense of the Word, refers to writers as servants of memory. Museums have a similar function. Viewed as a global network, they are servants of our planet's shared memory. Museum collections, then, can provide society with a necessary platform from which its members can contemplate positive pathways to attaining sustainable futures. 
As the global society directs its attention to the challenges and opportunities inherent in moving from a mass consumption society towards a future sustainable one, museums have a unique opportunity to embrace the role of being key intellectual and civic resources. ICOM must offer leadership to mobilize the global museum community and to engage our public in positive collective action in the pursuit of sustainable solutions. The future of tradition is ensuring that an active museum sector led by ICOM can contribute to the United Nations vision of transforming our world. I would now, now like to invite the president of ICOM to introduce our keynote speaker. Welcome to Sustainable Futures. Good morning again. Uh, I would like to thank Maureen Rees, Chair of ICOM's Working Group on Sustainability for giving us some background on the topic of sustainability and an insight into the work of this very active working group. I'm also grateful to our speakers who have come from different regions of the world in order to share with us their invaluable experience as museum professionals and their different perspectives on sustainability issues. I'm looking forward to hearing their presentations and I'm convinced that we will all gain precious inspiration from their contributions. Now, I would like to introduce our first guest, Dr. Mamoru Mori, who I have invited to give an introduction talk, especially because of his involvement in a leading science museum engaged in favor of a more sustainable future. Dr. Mori is Chief Executive Director at Mirai Khan, the National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation, which opened in 2001 in Tokyo. Being both a museum and a research center, this institution specifically helps bringing researchers and visitors closer and seeks to consider the potential for science and technology in contributing to a sustainable future of society. Besides, Dr. Mori's experience as a scientist is quite extensive and diverse. In addition to being the first Japanese astronaut on space shuttle, he is committed to creating links uh, between researchers and society as part of his position at Mirai Khan, but also through other activities such as science TV shows. I first met Dr. Mori in 2017 during the Science Center World Summit where he served as chair of the event. Under his steering, this major international summit realized the establishment of the Tokyo Protocol, which was endorsed by the World Science Center's museums networks in support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It has been envisioned as an action plan, actually, and a behavioral guideline for science museums to assist in the realization of a sustainable future and creation of a sustainable society by science communication activities. I would like to thank Dr. Mori again for being with us here today uh, to share his unique experience as scientist and museum professional. And I would like to invite him to the stage, please. Thank you, the ICOM president, uh, Ms. Aksoy. The thing you guess, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, or good afternoon now. Um, it is a great honor for me to present a few thoughts to this prestigious conference. I would like you to consider that the networks and activities of the museums worldwide are one fiber woven into the beautiful fabric of human culture. This is my museum, Mirai Khan's symbol exhibit, the Geocosmos. 
I hope every visitor experiences what I saw in space and to feel, ponder, and understand the Earth as the only planet to sustain life. Miracle's vision proposed in 2011 state that for 10 billion people to sustain their lives on Earth, Miracle designs, develops, and delivers science communication activities to all with the goal of discovering solutions to global challenges by collaborating with science museums and other stakeholders. Miracle's mission coincides with the United Nations, as you know, Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. We believe museums around the world should play a new role towards human sustainability. Two years ago, Miracan hosted the Science Center World Summit 2017 under the theme of connecting the world for a sustainable future. The summit is a gathering of the members of the World Science Museum networks, along with a wide variety of stakeholders from societies. The first summit was held in 2014 in Belgium, 2017 in Tokyo, and 2020 in Mexico City. Tokyo's summit proposed the Tokyo Protocol that science museums activities should meet the United Nations SDGs. I believe this ICOM conference here in Kyoto has been positioned along the same lines, but on a much broader scale of museums and thereby more influential than our summit. Therefore, I hope a more diversified, wider group of museums will be involved in activities for the sustainability of humans. Let me show you how the human specified uh, species is identified from space. Earth is so beautiful, floating in utter blackness of dark space. This wondrous Earth has existed with a multitude of life for almost four billion years. In daytime, no human activity can be seen, except in snow-covered areas. Let me explain. When we orbited the Northern Hemisphere in February, we flew over the Asian continent, and I saw many black dots on the white snow. The bigger the dot, the more people. Very big black areas had millions of people. The darker dots result from burning coal. And that changes the color of a human environment as seen from space. In North America and Europe, for example, in this screen, dots were less dark because of using other than coal as energy. Nighttime and human existence is clearly on display. I first saw these magnificent lights in 1992 with just 5.5 billion people on Earth. And now our species is exceeding 7.5 billion. Even more lights. In addition to the orange illumination, what you are seeing from space of the planet is beautiful and deadly and forever changed my life. This is what I saw at the space shuttle from uh, flew through the aurora. And keep in mind, the aurora is a result of deadly solar winds. But not what changed my life. It was the thin, delicate atmosphere that covers and protects Earth from the dangers of cosmic radiation and allows all life to exist. 
Human exist as a result of Earth environment. Uh, this graph shows a variation of average temperature of the Earth within the last 100,000 years. We have been lucky over the last 10,000 years as the average temperature has been warm and steady, called Holocene. Our ancestors existed in an ice age of more than 100,000 years and survived by following migrating animals, thus living without a settlement. Though the humans suffered shortages of food in freezing environment all the time, the Holocene period allowed our species to invent agriculture and so to live in a permanent place. This provided a unique sustainable lifestyle that separated the human species from other life form. Since agriculture, the human population increased and has greatly accelerated in recent decades due to many advances, particularly from science and technology. A new era began when the human species acquired a global view from space as it convinced us that our planet is the only environment we have to sustain our species. Then at the beginning of this century, we had a genomic view on the atomic level. That convinced us that human species is not so special among the diversified earthbound life forms from the viewpoint of DNA sequence. Now, Earth is hitting humans with hard reality. Artificial intelligence is creating a super nature and a super reality. We need measures to deal with these in order to sustain humanity. Science and technology provide a new perspective, the tsunagari of life, which means in Japanese, establishing a relationship with a network of life over time. It starts with every life form consisting of cells and for living cells to be sustained, they need atmosphere, light and temperature. We now move to the individual human, and I call that the tsunagari of the individual. The individual tsunagari sustains the individual with the essence of life, food, air, water. But the individual's life span is only around 100 years at the most. To continue, we need the tsunagari of societies with the goal of sustaining human life. A human society is made up of many cultures, such as religion, military, nations, politics, to name a few. No one name, culture, no one culture alone can sustain a society. Rather, each culture contributes to the whole. This society concept worked quite well until humans started having major impact on our planet. Now, we are aware of global problems that affect all life. Just as no one individual can, su can sustain a society, no one society can sustain our planet. To sustain our human species, we must sustain the natural environment of Earth. So we must progress to the tsunagari of planet of life. A transformation designed to sustain all life through the integration of all combined wisdom from all societies by means of science communication. 
It is important to realize that humans are just one of 50 million life forms. All are connected through the global environment, through biodiversity, sustainability, symbiosis, and the genome. In order to bring all this together, we need a fresh perspective, a global wisdom of our whole Earth, thereby ensuring the sustainability of the human race. The world's museums have great potential to contribute to human sustainability, utilizing tsunagari within as many uh, possible cultures. Resulting in a grand global wisdom, we can work towards sustaining this phenomenal planet of life and thus sustain our species. And I leave you with this image that always gives me hope. It is from the moon orbiting Japanese spacecraft Kaguya. And we call it Earthrise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Modi, for your inspiring remarks. I would like now to give a brief account of the rest of the plenary session. We've invited four distinguished speakers, Sarah Sutton, Cecilia Lam, Bonita Bennett, and Yasiara Fruna, to share with us their personal experiences of addressing sustainability, to illuminate how museum practitioners, practitioners have a role to play in the transition to a more sustainable future and by so doing benefit themselves, their institutions, and society as a whole. To offer us all present today pathways to empowerment, ideas that we can take forward in our own work when we re return home from Kyoto. These key messages will then be revisited and elucidated by Henry McGee in his role as discussant. Finally, we will ask the panel and all of you present to contribute to an exchange of opinions a dialogue between members of the museum family that the working group on sus um, sustainability hopes will enrich the content of our report and recommendations and enhance the role of ICOM in curating sustainable futures. The first speaker is Sarah Sutton. Sarah Sutton works with the staff and leadership of cultural organizations as they develop sustainable solutions and foster climate action. As a member of the executive committee for We Are Still In, and as its culture and institution sector lead, she strengthens the American sector's support of the Paris Agreement. She is co-chair of the American Association for State and Local History, Task Force on Environment and Climate, and a board member of the American Alliance of Museums, Environment and Climate Network. She is also a co-author of the Green Museum, and author of the Environmental Sustainability at Historic Sites and Museums. She is a 2019 Salzburg Global Fellow. Sir. Hello to you all. Thank you to ICOM Sustainability Working Group for this invitation and to the conference planners and the museums of Japan for the glorious welcome we've all been experiencing. I'm very pleased to be here with you all. Please imagine a country anywhere in the world where there are museums. Imagine a museum professional preparing to leave her home for work. She steps out into the fresh air and makes her way easily through her community, being greeted and greeting others as she goes. When she pauses before crossing the thoroughfare, she smiles at the old structures lining the way, still holding the stories and the dreams of the place and the people. As she nears the waterfront, her mind slips back to before, 
when native plants and wildlife had been scarce here and people struggled to grow and find healthy foods. She reaches her destination, finding others already busy. There are researchers in the collection, curators in the community, educators in the schools, healthcare workers at a weekly clinic, scientists in the treetops, and dancers in the plaza. They and those they touch work continuously to reaffirm the values of just, healthy, responsible communities. She finds her way to her office. She is about to join a United Nations-sponsored weekly global conversation an exchange with other directors of museums committed to the health and well-being of cultural and natural communities on this planet. Now we, as we go about our work days, we use our skills, abilities, creativity, and freedom, and authority where we find it, to fulfill our institution's missions in pursuit of the greater good. Museums are charitable institutions, which means they are identified as value, valuable for the public good. In the United States, in the recognition of that good, they are released from taxes. They use their mission statements to define their public benefit. And increasingly, they use vision statements to describe their responsibilities to their communities. To me, the words to help Earth, to heal the world, describe the collective mission of the world's museums. With this as our mission, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are our strategic plan. Two of these align with your work most closely and most obviously. Number 13, climate action, and number 17, partnerships for the goals. But each of us can go back to our homes, to our institutions, our families, and find the ways that we can contribute to all of those. In so doing, you will be linking your museum to this global strategic plan. So what would that look like? Whoops. Imagine that museum director as her meeting ends. She clicks the discussion to end the web conference connection. Today's discussion was an encouraging review of museum's work for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Her favorite examples were the ones that helped women and girls gain access to education, and the ones that supported resilience work in urban and coastal communities, safeguarding cultural heritage from climate change. Now I've seen where we museums and the field does this well, but there is still more work to do. So now imagine your feelings, standing in a room with George, knowing that the Bishop Museum, the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, and the Honolulu Zoo, in their partnership, will be able to save other species, but they will not be able to save George. Imagine the Field Museum's rice garden, I'm sorry. I have seen where we do this and have important successes. A contemporary art exhibit at the Florence Griswold Museum in Connecticut brought big issues such as marine debris and pollution to land-based viewers and non-scientists, nevertheless, who care about our oceans. The Los Angeles Art and Design Museum partnered with the city to create the city's resilience plan. And here, the Fields Museum Rice Native, Garden, Native Rice Gardens are a living exhibition about natural history that showcases the museum's commitment to conservation and community, sharing the beauty and the vitality of native plants and wildlife habitat on the ancestral homelands of the Three Fires Confederacy the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. Not quite a century ago, this waterfront area was filled with coal and ash and cinders, coal ash and cinders from the Illinois Central Railroad Tunnel projects. Now it is becoming a restorative and educational example as it replaces the unsustainable front lawn, honors the indigenous peoples of this area, and advances the museum's work to decolonize its interpretation of indigenous cultures. All at once, they are advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals of life on land, climate action, and reducing inequality. And I have seen where we join with others for what matters most. On June 1st in 2017, 
when President Donald Trump announced his intention to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement, it seemed to me that those of us who care would still do this work. I created Museums for Paris, and I stepped beyond my role as a passionate professional to an out loud advocate for our world. Others from state and local governments, tribes, businesses, and finance and higher education banded together to do the same. And on the 5th of June, they announced the formation of We Are Still In, a US coalition of non-state actors in support of the Paris Agreement. Non-state means not the leading government. I was thrilled and I was left out at the same time because there were no cultural institutions in the agreement. Not quite a year later, though, they invited Museums for Paris to join We Are Still In as the cultural institution sector. And now, across the United States, US museums, zoos, gardens, historic sites, aquariums, and professional associations are now a vital, vital sector of the largest coalition anywhere in the world of supporters of the Paris Agreement. The world must know that Americans support the Paris Agreement. I hope our experience is useful to others that are planning similar alliances for the goals. Already, Japan has a climate initiative in this manner, and I'm thrilled to see that the HBS Museum here in Kyoto is a signatory. From the Association of Science and Technology Centers to the Abbey Museum in Maine, museums carry the flag forward. At the We Are Still In website, you will see us listed alongside Hewlett Packard, Lyft, Levi Strauss, all of us taking strides for energy efficiency, healthy spaces for children, and protecting sites against sea level rise and climate impacts. Each of us has an important role to play in this. In closing, museums hold in one body the diverse physical and intellectual resources, abilities, creativity, freedom, and authority to foster the changes the world needs most, to help Earth to heal our world, using education, research, and creativity to mobilize collaborative and collective action for significant environmental impact so that health, justice, and cultures flourish. Thank you for joining us today and I give you all my best wishes for our work together. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Our next uh, speaker is Cecilia Lamb. Cecilia is the founding director of the Jockey Club Museum of Climate Change and the director of the Campus Planning and Sustainability Office at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Special Administrative, Administrative Region, China. With a portfolio including strategic planning and sustainability in higher education, she also oversees the program operations of the Hong Kong chapter of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network and serves as a member of the Hong Kong Sustainable Campus Consortium. Cecilia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank ICOM for the invitation and for this opportunity to um, speak to all of you about the Jockey Club Museum of Climate Change at the University of Hong Kong and what we have been doing to promote sustainability and sustainable development in Hong Kong and in the wider region. So, um, First of all, let me introduce the museum to you. Uh, we are the world's first climate change museum, established in December 2013, uh, with a generous donation of the biggest charitable organization in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charities Trust, and that's why the name of our museum. So our vision is to promote positive changes in knowledge, attitudes, behavior, in relation to climate change. So, um, 
At the bottom of the slide, you can see that there are four colorful squares, which represents uh, four of the relevant SDGs that we are working towards. Um, SDG four, quality education. Uh, 11, uh, sustainable communities. 13, climate action. And 17, partnerships for the goals. So how do we achieve the vision of the museum? As a museum, the first thing first, first exhibitions. So we try to introduce to the public the cause and the devastating effects of climate change that could cause to human life. We also show them the innovative research conducted by the research researchers in the Chinese University of Hong Kong and elsewhere, which tackles climate change challenges. Also, at the same time, our exhibitions also show them, show the public, the visitors, positive changes in the behavior can help contribute to a sustainable future for everybody. So apart from exhibitions, we also organized a lot of different community programs to engage the public in promoting sustainable development. The current one we are organizing in, in the museum is called uh, Climate Action. And of course, at the same time, we rely on the donation from our uh, donor uh, so that we can run the museum and offer free admission to everybody, and so that more people can come to our museum to uh, see what uh, we have to offer. And at the same time, we also count on the partnerships with other NGOs and charitable organizations. So climate action, what is it about? It is a three-year community program designed to empower Hong Kong people to propose innovative solutions and take positive action to meet the climate threat. So when they come to the museum, they are going to see um, a lot of um, uh, facts about climate change, how it is affecting us, and we want to let them know to empower them with the knowledge, um, to uh, encourage them, to push them to really act and make a change. And the key initiatives under this climate action program are one, mobile museum and virtual tour, two, nurturing future sustain sustainability leaders, and three, public action projects. So why do we want to offer a mobile museum and virtual tour? Because we want to extend the scope and reach of the museum's public engagement. We also want to provide an enticing taste of what a visit of the actual museum would be like so that people are attracted to really pay a visit to our museum. And very importantly, we also want to spark a wider interest in climate change among the public. We want more people to care. For the mobile museum, it is actually a snapshot of the, what the actual museum has to offer, and it is a series of portable and easily set up modular structures on free loan to schools, community centers, and other public places where they want to uh, get the whole community together to uh, do something about climate change, how we can make a change to what uh, climate change is uh, threatening us, um, how we could uh, reduce the carbon footprint of everybody. For the virtual tour, we try to um, provide an unprecedented worldwide access to everybody. So there would be absolutely no physical boundaries and no time constraints. You can visit our museum anytime you like, anywhere you are. And as a university museum, young people are always our main target. That's why the second initiative of the Climate Action Program is nurturing future sustain sustainability leaders. Our aim is to provide a platform for the young people to explore, experiment, advocate, and act. So we currently have two programs to support this goal. The first one is called MOCC Ambassadors. University students 
are trained to become docents who are able to lead uh, museum tours and also eco tours. So uh, through this experience, they would have a lot of opportunities to interact with the public and to understand what they do not know about climate change. And accordingly, they can uh, give them uh, uh, a like share their experience or give them advice or suggestions on what they can do to uh, reduce their carbon foot, foot, uh, footprint and become part of the change agents. And the second program is uh, called Team MOCC. It is designed for uh, high school students. Uh, we try to provide experiential and service learning for the high school students and challenge them through this experience to build sustainability into their daily lives. And what is important here is that we don't just want them to, to be part of it. We want them to bring the message back to, uh, to their families, to their uh, schools, and also the communities. And we hope everybody gets involved. So the third part is uh, public action projects. Our aim is to engage the public in uh, all sustainability matters and to promote positive action by the public. It is because we understand that uh, when people come to visit the museum, they may be very interested in looking at the exhibitions. But after they left, they probably would not do anything about it in future. So uh, what we have in mind is that we want to engage them. So after they uh, leave the museum, after they watch, uh, they see the exhibitions, we want them to take away with something and really act on it. Uh, here are three examples. The first one is a waste reduction project. This is a project uh, designed for high school uh, stu uh, students, and we provide them with a training in eff effective waste management. And then they are challenged to identify ways, uh, innovative ways to achieve uh, zero waste. And again, uh, we want them to bring the message across back to their uh, families and communities. The second example is Sustainability Hub. It is an online resource portal with a collection of tools and resources to help people to go green. And together with the uh, uh, Sustainability Hub, we have an action monitor. It is also an online tool uh, in which the users can set their own green targets. And then they can uh, monitor their own performance from time to time so that they know which areas they need to uh, improve. So uh, lastly, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the global, global sustainable development partnerships we have made. So currently, uh, the MOCC is the um, uh, sec uh, sec secretariat of the Hong Kong chapter of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We established uh, SDS in Hong Kong last year in January, and we wanted because we wanted to join the global, uh, global community to contribute to the advancement of the seven SDGs uh, introduced by the United Nations. And in the same year, we also established the SDSN Youth Hong Kong uh, in order to provide a platform for the young people to champion the cause of sustainable development and promote SDGs. And last year, we organized a total of 49 activities. And as you can see from the table, uh, we try to have all our uh, activities address as many SDGs as possible. So we also want to bring this message to the whole Hong Kong community. And we hope that people would see that it is important and it is high time for every one of us to act. So I hope our experience will be helpful to all of you. And before I end the presentation, uh, please uh, may I invite all of you to visit us when you are in Hong Kong in person or just go to our website to try our virtual tour. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, our next speaker is Bonita Allison Bennett, Director of District 6 Museum in South Africa. She was appointed as the Director of District 6 Museum in 2008. Her professional training is as an educator with strong anti-apartheid activist roots, and she completed both her under- and postgraduate degrees at the University of Cape Town. Her master's dissertation focused on narratives of people who were forcibly removed from various areas in the Western Cape and apartheid. 
She is currently registered as a doctoral student at the University of Pretoria. Both her parents are from District 6 and she grew up in a township on the Cape Flats with other families who were displaced. The District 6 Museum provides a wonderful platform from which to confront the legacies of apartheid displacement and to also raise awareness about the indivisibility of human rights. Bonita. Good morning. And I'd also like to just say thank you to the ICOM organizing committee for inviting me to be part of this, or actually inviting the District 6 Museum to be part of this conversation, which is so important. And I bring you greetings from Cape Town, from our patrons, our board of trustees, and our staff at the District 6, um, District 6 Museum. So in introducing myself, I just briefly want to say that my own, as you would have seen, my own background is in education, and human rights, and my concerns and passions at the moment are about the fragmentation of South Africa's communities and about recognizing those opportunities for contributing to the ongoing and dramatic turnaround that we need to make in our country. And my personal passion and my organizational passion come together very perfectly in the work of the District 6 Museum, which is a museum that is slightly different from the others that, that, uh, that form part of this panel, which is not directly related to climate change, but it's taken a broader view on the whole issue of sustainability. So in briefly introducing our museum, I thought I'd just give you a snapshot through our mission statement, which is that we are an in internationally engaged museum of innovation working with the members of District 6 and other communities affected by forced removals and contributing to the cultural reconstruction and restitution of post-apartheid South Africa. And in thinking about that, we believe that it is a very invigorating and exciting time to be a museum at this particular juncture in history. We exist at a time when museums are no longer regarded as distant and aloof spaces but as potentially exciting nodes of meaningful engagement. We exist at a time when people have access to information and knowledge, forming sources on so many different platforms. And they are very discerning in their high expectations of us. We are required to work with the past, with traditions, with remembrance, while being future focused. Our sustainability resides in our ability to ride these challenges and to ensure that legacy is translatable into, con into the context which future generations have to navigate. For our own survival, we dare not be stuck in the past, but must continue to be inspired by it. As a museum that has its origin in the struggle for, for land justice during the latter part of the apartheid period, the District 6 Museum in Cape Town in South Africa is firmly placed within the struggle of a community to achieve a state where no one is left behind, one of the intentions of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. It came into being both to conserve the memory of the community that was destroyed under apartheid, which broadly speaking existed from 1948 to 1994, but also to support the land claim and the right of people to return to the land from which they were forcibly removed as a result of apartheid laws when the diverse area was declared for whites only. The bulldozers moved in to break down people's homes and destroyed the street grid so that minimal traces remained of them having lived there. As people were moved to barren dormitory townships, they, the relationships were severed on a number of levels, and these include the severing of the relational fabric of the community, which was ripped apart from the neighborhood and the support structures of family and friends and neighbors as they were sent to different places. There was a severing of the community's relationship with the land, which included practices to supplement the food resources which were scarce from time to time, and they practiced foraging from the land on which they lived. Another broken connection was a spiritual connection with Table Mountain, which formed the backdrop to the community. 
and the same applied to the visual connection with Table Bay overlooking the Atlantic, together with all the resources provided by the sea, such as food, employment, enjoyment, and comfort. And much as it li we'd like to think that we are contributing to all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals, our work more clearly falls within the seven that I've got on the screen there. Some of them quite directly and others, we've, we've stretched the definition a little bit to also challenge ourselves and others around us to, to broaden our understanding of that. For example, good health and well-being, we are very, very passionate about ensuring that well-being and health and the connection between psychosocial health is made. And so in our work with memory, healing, and trauma, we want to ensure that when we talk about health of individuals and communities, that this is also taken into account and that it's not only the physical health and well-being of people. When we talk about quality education, we also want to ensure that the non-formal learning that comes from communities, the indigenous knowledge systems, the crafts of the past, the close connection of living in synchronicity with the land, that that is also part of the ongoing education that takes place within communities. In working with reduced, or working towards a state of reduced inequalities, that is more evident in our work with land restitution and supporting people's right to land justice and also to food security. In building sustainable, sustainable cities and communities, we are also very passionate about ensuring that communities and what is the essence of a community is that they build the re resilience and resources to engage robustly with policy and with um, practices that, that come from government as well as on a local level. Responsible cons consumption and production, um, District 6 being an urban community, uh, is very much part of the movement where people are working towards growing food, not lawns, and so also to support the sustainable um, access to food from the land that people live on. Peace, justice, and strong institutions is also part of our work, and so in our ongoing public education work, um, with communities, with schools, with other institutions as well, that comes to the fore quite, quick, quite clearly. And of course, we have to form partnerships, partnerships for these goals, because we have to amplify the impact that we want to make. So in thinking about the new reconstituted, reconstituted community of District 6, which is slowly and painfully taking shape together with a number of stakeholders of which the museum is but one, we see a future which references the community's past but is very distinct from it. In this newly built and reconstituted community, we need to pay attention to intentionally constructing mechanisms for living in closer alignment with the environment and restoring the severed relationships brought about by political acts of dispossession. Through these acts, a relationship with the land was severed and it was replaced with houses for people to live on a barren landscape to which they had no relationship. All traditional relationships to the land were ignored and overwritten by oppressive actions. The image that you see there is of our former late President Nelson Mandela handing over symbolically the keys to the two old, eldest returnees who were coming back to the land, symbolizing the start of the new community. Modern times, especially as it relates to post-disposition, is characterized by fragmentation, disconnection, and damage to people and their environments. We are learning from a past which was once grounded, coherent, relationship-focused, and which might have been considered to have been simpler, in inverted commas, and more unsophisticated. When we think about the future of District 6 in Cape Town, which is in some senses a model for urban restitution in our country, the future will include the dispossessed and their descendant families forging new relationships with each other and with the rituals and traditions possibly remixed for a new time and context, being rediscovered and reinstituted 
as important binders of the community's ethos. We think of a robust community engaging with policy and being very active in their access to culture. We see a restored relationship with the land and uh, uh, the growth of community gardens. We also see, very importantly, the strong awareness of the, the um, inclusion of green lungs in urban spaces and work towards the development of parks, including a District 6 Memorial Park. A community like District 6, which is being rebirthed in some ways, has the opportunity to think of living with a lighter carbon footprint, and we want to ensure that mechanisms for recycling and upcycling are embedded in the community. We will look at economic sustainability and how jobs can be created so that indirectly we also address the sustainable goal of reducing poverty um, within the community. And of course, building partnerships and solidarity is very important to what we do. So how does this happen? I have so, just very briefly some images on the screen to give you an idea of some of the work that the museum does. Right in the corner at the top there, you will see a group of women who have come together in an oral history project around food and memory. And they have taken, as you can see, they're working with herbs and the traditional understanding and, and the knowledge that, that in some ways is being lost in terms of how those herbs were used both for healing and for sustenance. And in the storytelling and conversations, which have an intergenerational component as well, where young people are often involved in interviewing them, they are also using their knowledge to create textile designs and then product development, which is part of income generation as well. So the crafts of seamstressing and tailoring, which was also one of the crafts very, very prevalent in the area, but which has now been replaced by the large factories, and lots of mechanization, which is important on one level, but it is over, overlaying the traditional crafts of the area as well. M much of the District 6 Museum's practice has been a model for engagement with the land and understanding that restored relationship as well. And so what you see there are the end results of site interventions where people are reclaiming the reconnection to the land from which they were displaced. On specific days, there are rituals of remembrance and some of those are being enacted there. In the corner on, the, on your right, the far right bottom, that is a performance by young people who've interpreted the archive and are leading the community through the area in a dramatic performance on the site as well. And on top of that, on, also on the right-hand side, the, the top is a reminder of the musical traditions which were very important to the community and that are being re reintroduced as well as part of memorialization and part of reconnecting to the land. So I'm working here with a, a, a model of sustainability which is much broader, which requires uh, collaboration across disciplines and also requires us to break down organizational and institutional boundaries. So sustainability in the context of an independent museum such as we are, which is, exists as a non-governmental organization, it's often understood as economic because of the ongoing challenges of raising the funds to remain afloat. While this is a concern that will not go away in the short term, a greater threat to our sustainability would be the loss of connection and the relevance to the community who birthed this museum. When, educa when our education programs are in question, when our role in, support, in supporting the struggle for gender e equality, when our work in reducing in inequality, working towards a sustainable city and community, life and land, peace and justice, and partnerships to achieve these goals, if those are the things that are in question in terms of the work with, that we are doing, then we would be more on shaky ground in terms of our sustainability than not having the money to do the work. Sharing a birth year with that of the new South Africa locates us also very firmly within our new constitution together with the Bill of Rights to which the intentions of the Sustainable Development Goals are closely aligned. We are passionate in our attempt to leave no one in, in, behind and this is our way of doing that. I thank you.
Thank you, Benita. Uh, final speaker is Yasse Ara Frohner. She holds a degree in history from the Federal University of, of uh, Europe Preto, a master's in social history and a PhD in econo economic history with emphasis on cultural heritage. She was trained in restoration by the Center for Conservation Restoration and in cons conservation by the Getty Conservation Institute. She is currently a professor at the School of Fine Arts at the undergraduate course in Visual Arts and Conservation Restoration and lecturing at the graduate program in arts. She also coordinates the graduate program in built environment and sustainable heritage at the Faculty of Architecture of the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Merci. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's up here. Bien. Uh, gracias a los compañeros del Grupo de Trabajo en Sustainabilidad. Uh, gracias a LICO en Kioto y la LICO Internacional. Es un honor estar aquí. Uh, me gustaría empezar presentando algunos puntos relacionados con la función social de los museos en el contexto actual de crisis climática y con el concepto de sostenibilidad, principalmente si consideramos el rol fundamental de la cultura en logro de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Básicamente, esta comunicación plantea preguntas en lugar de afirmaciones. ¿Existe la posibilidad de discutir emergencias climáticas y prácticas sostenibles sin discutir la justicia social? ¿Puede el museo ser un actor proactivo para la educación, la integración comunitaria, la ciencia y la conciencia política necesaria para apoyar las acciones de las personas y los gobiernos de todo el mundo en el contexto del cambio climático? Este es un mundo único, un planeta único, y necesitamos una conciencia global del hecho de que el cambio climático afectará a todos los seres humanos. Sin embargo, la respuesta a este problema será la misma para todos los países, para todas las regiones y continentes. El hemisferio norte y el hemisferio sur tiene los mismos desafíos. Los principales factores de emisiones de CO2 en el hemisferio norte son causados por los patrones de consumo y el modelo energético. En los últimos años, varios países de la América Latina y África se están moviendo hacia un modelo social económico de mayor consumo que puede cambiar el mapa actual de emisiones de CO2 en los próximos años. ¿Cuál es el rol de los museos en este contexto? Los museos deben comprender el debate actual y buscar formas de incorporar los objetivos del desarrollo sostenible. Por lo tanto, cada institu institución puede convertirse en un agente del cambio en su propio contexto social. El enfoque sur-sur, el diálogo con las acciones de sostenibilidad del hemisferio norte, debe basearse en la cooperación. Los programas de desarrollo de capacidad con respecto a los ODS y el apoyo del ICOM y los comités internacionales y los, a los comités nacionales sur-sur pueden marcar la diferencia en este contexto. ¿Cuáles son los principales problemas actuales en América Latina y África? La expansión de la agricultura latifundista a expensas de la agricultura familiar y las prácticas extractivas sostenibles baseadas en modelos comunitarios. El contexto de iniquidad económica y social que acentúa las crisis humanitarias en la perspectiva del cambio climático. En el caso de Brasil, las políticas gubernamentales actuales relacionadas con los pueblos indígenas y el medio ambiente, así 
como el apoyo incondicional para, para la explotación minera, amenazan da, las áreas florestales. En los últimos meses, la invasión de las tierras indígenas y los incendios florestales en la Amazonia son del conocimiento internacional. Como los museos, los espacios culturales y los monumentos pueden contribuir para cambiar esta realidad? Educación, integración con la comunidad, investigación, cambios estructurales, estructurales internos en su propio consumo de energía y adopción de prácticas sostenibles. Los niños, los jóvenes y los adultos deben ser educados sobre los problemas relacionados con la crisis climática, sus causas y consecuencias, y cómo cada ciudadano puede ser un agente transformador a través de sus acciones personales. Esta es la, formas que, es la forma que los museos pueden ayudar a las personas a conectarse con información científica confiable y precisa, en lugar de obtener su, su información solamente de las redes sociales, que es vulnerable a las fake news. La FAO ha publicado documentos importantes que correlacionan los cultivos tradicionales con la protección florestal. En este contexto, la diversidad del estilo de vida de las comunidades se presenta como una forma de resistencia y resiliencia. Estos instrumentos deben ser utilizados para guiar las actividades de los museos y su integración con sus comunidades. ¿Cómo los museos pueden integrar comunidades y convertirse en espacios de voz y escucha? ¿Cómo pueden promover la visibilidad de las comunidades que adoptan prácticas sostenibles como los pueblos indígenas y así protegerlas? ¿Cómo pueden abrazar la diversidad y, por tanto, la supresión del prejuicio? Los museos son espacios educativos por excelencia, que crean conciencia a través de las curadurías y de la investigación. La investigación de los museos ayuda a los especialistas a comprender el cambio del entorno natural a partir del cambio social. Las pesquisas en los más diversos campos del conocimiento expuestas al público pueden educar y permitir una conciencia global del cambio ambiental y sus impactos. Solo la conciencia pública sobre la crisis climática puede motivar y promover las acciones necesarias para cambiar las direcciones políticas en todo el mundo. Hablamos de educación, integración comunitaria e investiga investigación como herramientas para la transformación. Pero el mundo en sí, el museo en sí, debe adoptar prácticas sostenibles y convertirse en un ejemplo para la sociedad. Para ser un agente de cambio, los museos mismos deben ser ejemplos de cambio. Es crucial repensar el uso de energía med mediante la adopción de sistemas limpios y nuevas estrategias de control climático, así como prácticas sostenibles. Si celebramos en Kioto, los museos como ejes culturales baseados en la demanda de construir un futuro a través de la tradición, los museos deben apoyar y difundir prácticas sostenibles de gestión ambiental. La adhesión de los museos a los ODS, a los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, es una, es una oportunidad para demostrar que la investigación científica y toda acción educativa, artística y cultural del museo es un elemento importante que debe tomarse en serio cuando se habla de desarrollo sostenible. El museo debe preparar a la generación actual para el futuro y el futuro de la humanidad depende de una mayor comprensión de la demanda de justicia social 
y de la protección del medio ambiente. Este es nuestro mayor desafío a los principios del siglo XXI. En vista de los trágicos eventos en la región de la selva amazónica en Brasil, me gustaría proponer una llamada a todos los museos de historia natural, los museos de los estados brasileños de la Amazonia Ilegal y los museos de los países latinoamericanos cuyos territorios están ocupados por la Amazonia, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Guyana, Suriname y Guyana Francesa para discutir y promover actividades educativas de investigación sobre el problema de la deforestación, la quema y la política ambiental de la región. Precisamos ser agentes políticos. Gracias. I will now ask uh, Henry McGee to give a response to the four uh, presentations and point to commonalities within them. Henry uh, has had a long life passion for nature and has a background as a bird ecologist. He worked at Manchester Museum, part of the university from 2019 as a curator and head of the museum's curatorial team. He oversaw the development of award-winning galleries and special exhibitions linked to environmental sustainability and climate change. He has helped broker partnerships between researchers, museums, and policy workers, both in the UK and internationally, and is a member of the Working Group on Sustainability. Henry is interested in finding ways to accelerate museum contributions in na nature conservation, climate action, and the sustainable development goals, and working with people and organizations who want to go farther, faster, together, towards a world where people and nature flourish together. Henry. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Morian, and thank you uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak with you here today. Um, so I'd like to um, thank Dr. Mori for his very inspirational in introductory speech and our four speakers who have given their uh, excellent presentations. So they've each given us a personal and different perspective on how they are approaching sustainability. And we can all draw inspiration from their experiences to help us create, amplify and share our own sustainability stories. And I personally uh, draw great inspiration from our location because it was in this conference hall that the world's governments agreed to set legally binding targets to reduce greenhouse gases to prevent disastrous climate change. The Kyoto Protocol was agreed here in 1997 and set the direction towards the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. And we continue on that path today building the future on the foundations of the past. So there are estimated to be roughly uh, 55,000 museums in the world. Individually and collectively, they bring tremendous benefits to society and the environment, but they also have negative impacts through their use of energy and the waste that they produce. And collectively, they probably have a, an impact that's larger than that of a, of a small country. Um, working to be, become more sustainable means in simply enhancing our positive impacts and reducing our negative impacts. It is about trying to do more good and to do less harm. So the purpose of this plenary is to help us all understand how we can curate sustainable futures through museums. As we've heard from our four speakers and as I personally believe, the best initiative that we can all connect with is the Sustainable Development Goals. And I won't call them the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They're our Sustainable Development Goals. They are, belong to all of us, and they will benefit all of us and those who, who come after us. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So the goals were agreed by the world's governments in 2015 as a plan for pla people, planet, and prosperity 
with peace and partnerships. So people, planet and prosperity are the very traditional three dimensions of sustainability. Peace and partnerships are the things that will help them come together better. And partnerships is why, part of why we're all here today. So the Sustainable Development Goals address the world's greatest challenges, tackling poverty and hunger, inequality within and between countries, degradation of nature and climate change. The goals aim to ensure that no one is left behind, and I'd like to emphasize that point about ensuring no one is left behind. They also recognize that social and environmental challenges often have the same roots. They are interconnected and we can't tackle them alone or one at a time because we might just be creating problems for someone else. So the goals are relevant to all museums as they relate to both nature and culture. They apply to all countries and are also sensitive to local circumstances and challenges. They have been sent out as an invitation to all sectors to achieve a future where people and nature flourish together. Some goals relate very obviously to museums, so that means they will not be achieved without our participation. The Sustainable Development Goals need museums, but museums also definitely need the Sustainable Development Goals. If museums believe that they can make a difference, which of course they can, they, cannot, they just cannot ignore this call or it is museums who will be left behind. We should ensure that we are accelerators for the goals and not breaks. So there are 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets that support them. The reason there, there are so many is because they were put together by a very large con consultation exercise that involved many sectors of society. I've spent a great deal of time thinking about how museums can contribute effectively to the goals and targets, partly because 17 and 169 are just too many to remember, and also because our work will fit more clearly with some than others. So I would like to propose for you a framework of seven key activities that can be applied by all museums, each of you, and all of your networks to connect with the Sustainable Development Goals but of course you can also add in goals and targets specific to your situation. And I'd invite you all to think about these seven activities uh, in relation to the, the, the rest of the conference. So firstly, museums can all work to protect and safeguard cultural and natural heritage. This includes objects in their collections, collections information that makes collections usable, and intangible cultural heritage. But it also includes the cultural and natural heritage beyond our museums. Taking this approach helps museums to work in partnership with others involved in cultural and natural heritage. And it connects us with the wider world and, and Jesse's presentation uh, related to this point in, in particular. Secondly, Museums can support and provide learning opportunities that su the su support the Sustainable Development Goals. Educational programs can support people to live fulfilled lives in harmony with one another and with nature. But learning is not just about information. It is not enough for people to know about problems and challenges. They need to care about them and be empowered to be part of the solution. Empowered to act on their own concerns and in their own lives. Thirdly, museums can work to enable cultural participation for all. Culture is a human right that every, quote, everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits, end quote. Um, and that's from the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights. So to deny someone um, access to culture is to, die, to de deny their human rights. Ensuring people have opportunities to engage with the diversity of cultural, culture and cultural expressions is crucial for their own lives and for peaceful communities and societies. And, and Benita's uh, presentation related very strongly to this point. Fourthly, museums can support sustainable tourism, which addresses the needs of visitors, the tourism industry, the environment and host communities. 
Sustainable tourism can have very positive social, environmental and economic benefits and works to reduce any negative impacts of tourism. Fifthly, we can enable research in support of the Sustainable Development Goals. Collections are a distributed research resource that need to be cared for and developed for the long term. Collections help researchers understand the world, our place in it, and how to manage our impacts upon it. Social sciences and humanities research helps understand the richness of human imagination, creativity, and ingenu ingenuity, and can help support a transition to a sustainable future. Sixth, um, we can direct our internal leadership, management, and operations to support the Sustainable Development Goals. This means working to enhance our positive impacts and reduce our negative impacts. For example, supporting staff and ensuring employment rights, reducing waste and using energy wisely, and being accountable and transparent. It is about ensuring our institutions are run ethically, fulfilling our promise to society as custodians of cultural and natural heritage. And lastly, um, to direct our external leadership, collaboration and partnerships towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Partnerships are absolutely crucial to achieving the goals, and museums can work with policymakers, local government, researchers, civil society, with other sectors, with multiple countries, and of course with one another. And Cecilia and Pr Sarah's presentations resonated with this point. Now, museums are already doing many of these things, and that is great, as it means that we're already moving fast with some of these um, challenges. But we mustn't be complacent. If museums work to support these seven activities, to keep them in balance with, I'll just move on, to keep them in balance with one another, and to enhance their positive and, ne and reduce their negative impacts, and to work with one another and with other sectors, that is how I believe we will all, all curate sustainable futures together. And when, and when we reach uh, 2030 and the end of the sustainable develop, development goals, we will be able to say that we, we, we did what we could, we played our part. Um, and in, in order to help those of you who are less familiar with the goals, um, I've put together a, a booklet um, which is available for free. It's just it's, um, um, being distributed widely. Um, and it kind of it maps the seven activities against the 169 targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. So that covers a third of all of the targets of the goals, which is a, a pretty good contribution. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you. I'd like uh, now to uh, ask all our distinguished speakers to the stage. Uh, the panel will be responding to, a quest responding to a question that will be on the screen in a couple of moments. We have the question. Here they are all. Here are our speakers. And uh, this 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 So could we have the question, please? Yeah. 
So in the time that's uh, left to us, we are going to have a look at this question that um, uh, the panel will have a short discussion on, and then we'll open it up for uh, brief comments from the audience. So maybe Sarah, would you like to begin? If I had to say one thing, I would say, let go of the anxiety. Let go of excessive pride and confidence. They interfere with the progress that we are all making. And instead, we need curiosity, creativity, and courage to create the changes that we need most. Thank you. Bonita. I would say that one, one piece of advice would be to really believe in people and what they, what they know and wh or what they can develop together. And so that museums don't position themselves as the experts within the institution because people can, working very closely with people, helps us to discover those solutions. And I think we all have to become very astute listeners and then also ensure that the listening that happens with the current generation of museum professionals, that it continues and that the institutional, there isn't a break in that institutional, institutional memory, but that it continues throughout the organization. Thank you. And Cecilia. Uh, I echo Bonita saying that um, people can work together with people. And on top of that, I would also like to add one point. Uh, that is, people can change. Uh, change sounds hard. Uh, it seems that it, uh, it is very difficult to change because it, it always is like that uh, when we are talking about change, we are talking about inconvenience. But just let us uh, think it this way. If we get everybody move, we, if we get everybody act, so even one small step can make a big change. So uh, we went to the um, United Nations office in Geneva and got this booklet. It is uh, 170 daily actions. You can make a big change by 170 small daily actions. So it is not that hard. Thank you. Yes, sir. So uh, try to work with your communities, first of all. And inside the institution, try to understand how your institution uh, are acting to achieve the sustainable development goals. Finally, Henry. I think the, the one thing I would say is um, uh, not to underestimate how much other sectors recognize the, vol the value of education and even museums. Um, so museums are um, specifically mentioned in the work plan for the pa Paris Agreement, Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so other sectors recognize our importance, they just don't quite know how to connect with us sometimes. So I like to th think of this as a kind of adventure and I think I'd invite you all to accept that call to adventure. Thank you, Henry. Before we open the dialogue to you all in the audience, either in the form of concise comments, questions, or simply examples in response to the answers the panel have given and the presentations earlier, uh, I'd like to invite you to be brief and remain within the boundary that the question imposes. I'd like to thank you for your understanding. We're already running a bit late and we have about six or seven minutes. So the floor is open. Thank, thank you very much for your very impressive presentation. Uh, thank you very much to the ICOM organization. I have one question. What have we been doing or what have you been doing as an organization to offset the cost and the footprint of all of us coming here to this conference? Um, I'm from Climate Reality Project, uh, one of Al Gore's people. Thank you very much. 
Okay, Sarah. I annually offset all of my sustainable museums and my family's carbon impact. I annual, every year, I offset my business, sustainable museums, and my family's carbon um, impact through Climate Neutral, Neutral Now, which is a UN uh, program. And at the American Alliance of Museums, we honor our awardees every year with a gift of climate offsets, which was 150 tons this year. Um, Cecilia. Uh, for us, uh, like Sarah uh, just said, we try to offset uh, each trip uh, we took on business because um, it is uh, just feel like our responsibility to do so. So uh, we try to also encourage other uh, uh, units in, in the university and even our partners in the um, uh, NGOs in other uh, sectors of uh, uh, Hong Kong. So um, I think Probably, like we said, together we can uh, uh, make a big change and we hope this could carry on uh, in different uh, sectors of society. Thank you. More questions? Comments? Examples? Microphone up there, please. Nihongo demo daijo desu ka? Thank you for presentation. Uh, I want to ask to Ms. Bonita. Nihongo de daijo desu ka? This translation system. Uh, <laughs> okay. Eh, to, ma, workshop o hakubutsukan de okonatte, de sono senjumi no chishiki da to ka, craft no chishiki te no wo hikitsui de iki, ma, hitobito ni mo atae, so shite koyo mo sousutsu shite iku te no ga sugoku subarashi to omai mashita. で日本でも同じようにやはり伝統の技術だとかそういったものが失われつつあってどうにか同じようにできたら面白いなと思うんですけれどもその、まあ、地元の人たちがそうやって、えー、クラフトを学んでものを作って販売するということでその、まあ、ミュージアム全体の取り組みだとか、えー、持続可能なようにお金は回っているのだろうか、まあ、経済的な部分ですね。でもうちょっと何か別の寄付があったりだとか政府からのお金をもらったりだとかしているんでしょうか Thank you for the question.、Um, a little bit of both. We got some grants to start off the project, but at the moment some of the small projects are, I won't say they are able, they are large enough to. to Uh, really change the long term economic status at the moment of the people who are participating and benefiting, but it is guaranteeing people some income at the very basic level at the moment. So, some people who have not had an income are able to earn money from that, but I wouldn't claim that it is dealing with poverty alleviation as such. But it's a, re a really I, th I think there is potential to grow it from a micro example. We were trying to see if this can work. And there's a lot of interest, both in terms of the, the sustainable tourism market and also a local market. So I do believe that there is the potential for it to grow much bigger. Thank you. Henry. I, I wanted to say something as well,、um, which is about how we can use、um, culture and heritage as inspiration to help us all move forward.、So As I understand it, in, in Japan you have the concept of motenai, the, the,、um, the sad feeling when things are wasted.、Um, and this is a very beautiful idea which I think can, can be useful to many of us in, in other societies. Thank you. Thank you.、Um, one last question. We have a couple of minutes. 
Go down here, please. Go here. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been an inspiring session. Um, about 40 years ago in Bristol, England, we ran a, an event at the museum called 20 Ideas for Bristol to encourage local citizens from all communities to come and say how they would like their city to change. So the museum became an interlocutor with the community and that led to the development of something called Sustrans, an NGO which has now built 10,000 kilometers of cycleways in the UK. But also Bristol is now a leading green city in the UK. And I was just wondering if colleagues could give examples of how you engage with the community and encourage the community to come with their ideas and you help then translate that into policy or into culture in the, in the city or the community you're working in. Thank you. Henry. I can give an example to do with uh, climate change. Um, very often in museums we think of exhibitions as a kind of, um, they come and go one thing after the other, they, they're delivered um, and what I like to try to think of them as is as steps on a journey. So in, in Manchester we had, a, where I used to work, um, we developed a, an exhibition at the same time as the city's local climate change uh, policy was being developed and so we did it in partnership with um, the city council and um, with academics from the Tyndall Centre and, and myself from the museum. And um, it, you maybe come across this idea of the echo chamber, that one of the problems in society is that different stakeholders don't have much experience of, what, of, of one another. So they make their decisions based on, on presumptions and um, preconceptions. Um, so we used the exhibition as a way to um, garner public interest uh, in what was going on so that when people were presented with the consultation they would know how it related to their lives um, and it was it was like pretty successful I, I like to think um, and we presented that at the United Nations in 2017 I think and that was one of the steps on the journey to getting museums to feature in the work plan for the Paris Agreement so that's how these things go. Thank you Henry. Well um I'm sorry to say that the plenary is uh, nearing its end, but before we close, I'd like to invite Jenny Newell, editor of one of the few books in print addressing mu museums and climate change, to give a short introduction to the sustainability workshop this afternoon. Jenny. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Maria. So I'm Jenny Newell. I'm a member of the Working Group for Sustainability and the manager of climate change projects at the Australian Museum. I'm sure you've all been inspired by today's speakers. I know I have. And if you'd like to consider joining us for a workshop this afternoon, which is starting very soon um, at 2.30 in room E, it's called Curating Sustainable Futures Through Museums, and it will help you to find ways to turn this inspiration into action through your own institution. So th there's details in your program, and we've got space for about 120 people. So please come along to room E by a little bit before 2.30, because we're hoping to start right on time. Maybe grab your bento box and come and, and join us. And uh, come along for some ideas on how to upscale your power to have a positive impact on the world. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jenny. Uh, I'd like to thank all our speakers, uh, Dr. Murray, Sarah, Cecilia, Bonita, and Yassi and the organizers for the foresight in laying down such an important marker on the role of museums in addressing the challenges of attaining a sustainable future. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Home moderator and the speakers. Lunch is available in the event hall and new hall. Shuttle bus bound for satellite venue Inamori Memorial Hall is available at the entrance annex hall for every 15 minutes. It will take approximately 20-30 minutes from ICC Kyoto 
to set right venues. Please plan enough time to get to the satellite venues for international committees meetings. Please do not hesitate to ask our staff if you have difficulties in finding your way to the lunch venues. If you have used a receiver for simultaneous inter interpretation, please return it to the staff at the entrance. Thank you very much for your participation. モデレーター、スピーカーの皆様、ありがとうございました。ご昼食はイベントホール、ニューホールにてご用意しております。国立京都国際会館アネックスホール入り口より、稲森記念会館行きのシ,トルシャトルバスを15分間隔で連行しております国立京都国際会館とサテライト会場間の移動には20分から30分程度かかります時間に余裕を持って移動してください会場への移動場所などご不明な点がございましたらお近くのスタッフまでお声がけください同時通訳レシーバーをご利用された方は会場入り口にてご返却くださいご参加ありがとうございました